Welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. How are you doing today? We're good. We just had a, a meeting um, about what we're going to do to stay in shape as a company. And so we're all going to go out running and then we're going to compete at uh, 1500 meters distance, both as groups, uh, where you win by making the best improvements over a three month period. And, uh, and of course, if you're the fastest as an individual, then you also win an extra prize. Very good. That sounds very fair. Yeah, it's, a, it's something. And I mean, it gets us moving. So that's fun. Exactly, exactly. Well done. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really good. I just started at Spotify and there is so much to learn. Like the amount of onboarding documentation is, uh, is huge, huge and always evolving, but uh, br brilliant tech stack. I really like uh, and the people, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, people they, there are amazing. They, they put out uh, two videos in 2004 called Spotify Engineering Culture. You know them? No, but uh, I will look them up, definitely. And then you tell me if they are staying true to that message today. Um, because it's a great message and it has lots of interesting information in it. Mm, for sure, for sure. And I, I envy that kind of working environment. <laughs> me too, <laughs> that's why. But you're there now. <laughs> okay. So tell me, you wanted to talk about uh, yeah. a specific project. Yeah, so... Um, we talked uh, a while ago, and, and I talked to you about like what should we do Kubernetes or not, and and we kind of agreed that uh, well it, it would be more work, but you could maybe save some money, but there's nothing wrong with our like our setup as it is, um, and there's one thing um, that kind of uh, bothers me right now, and that is that we don't have a good way to do uh, uh, like. SecOps and and and, and like monitoring uh, of everything, um, like security modeling and stuff like that. It's it's since everything is just deployed into the pub onto the public internet, um, the security is, uh, I mean it's like every service is protected, but that's it. And if there is if sometimes we get uh, logging in in terms of what is built into Azure, uh, but all our apps are not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not consistent. Uh, consistent. And I know that you are a consistent freak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, well, put it mildly, but yes. <laughs> and, and so, so it's, we do things a little bit different. And so out of, out of, out of some pure chance, I ran across Dapper. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, this sidecar packing that they use, what would happen if we started packaging uh, our our applications um, like like they do uh, with this sidecar pattern how how much how could we like standardize uh, the way we, we split things apart and how, how, how much could we get uh, from from having like a centralized place to manage uh, our infrastructure because it seems that that dapper is is is, is many things and it seems like it would scale well uh, if we were to bring in dedicated DevOps people. Right now we're a very small team. Like this is this is development and DevOps basically. Like team of two. It. Yeah. This is it. Yeah. There's no one else. So so we have to be able to manage it. But we want to bring in more people. We want to grow, and we want to have a place to do that with 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 something that hopefully won't get in the way. And um, as I understand it. Uh, Dapper is built on top of Kubernetes and couldn't have been built without Kubernetes. Mm. And it, 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 it uses concepts in Kubernetes that I don't understand or know anything about. Uh, but it does this to, to orchestrate and manage your deployment. Uh, and, and I would very much like to know uh, what we could expect and, and, and uh, what life could be like. like, it's, like it's, a, it's, a, it's an idea stage. And I, I'm trying to kind of capture um, what could be if we did this. What problems would go away, and what problems w would we have to deal with instead? Uh, because I don't believe that problems go away. I believe they they transform 
<laughs> yeah, they, they actually, well, it, it's a very interesting problem because you're, you're in a position where you're at the beginning of how should we do, how should we scale and how should we manage that evolution towards like a bigger team? And um, the, the management of that is very hard to quantify, like how much work is going to take to maintain that. So I, I feel like it's a very difficult to answer for sure, but I, I'll do my best to give, yeah. like to share my knowledge. I don't claim to know everything, like far from it, but I, I hope I can help by uh, shedding some light onto like what is the problem. And I would, I would say let, let's first try to define the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, is, it, is this more like an audit perspective? Like, you, you need to be able to account for how, who accessed what, when, when? Yeah, that's one of the problems. Uh, we have regulatory requirements now that's going to make it... Uh, there's going to be a requirement, a hard requirement, to be able to say who did what where. Okay. Uh, we are also, uh, from a security perspective, we want to be able to say... Uh, we know that this happened exactly like this. We want to be able to, we want, there shouldn't be, there must never be a question about what happened that we can't answer. Yeah, right definitely. Now, right now, given how everything is orchestrated, and we have old, we have new stuff and old stuff. Um, we have to manually make sure that we put in code to make audit trails. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice if it would be possible to have that set before us uh, yeah. by some framework or infrastructure that we don't actually manage ourselves, that we don't write or build or maintain. Uh, so, that, so that's the dream. Problems. Yeah. Yeah. And there is one aspect of Dapper that I enjoy, and that is that it is not telling you um, how as much as it is standardizing some things. Because uh, you have the option to build your different applications in a variety of uh, languages and environments. And I think that's very important for us uh, because, sure, we have, s there is, like, we have some things that look in a particular way which have a heritage uh, um, and we're going to keep using that. Uh, and, of course, we need to be able to bring this forward uh, uh, and there needs to be some way to integrate things. Uh, but we also know uh, that some problems that we have, it's like there's a natural solution for that in Java, or there's a natural solution for that in Go, or a natural solution that in Node. Sometimes there's a natural way to do things, and, and we don't want to be bound to doing it in a specific programming language because that's the only thing we do. Hmm. So I want to have the, the flexibility to, to, to be of choice there. Um, and those were one of the things that attracted me to Dapper. Hmm. Yeah, I, I feel the like developer mindset then, because one of the thing, one of the big things here for us is ops. Um, uh, like, how do we do that? Uh, and there's also, the, I mean, this is harder for us to quantify because we're not very experienced with it. But it's maintaining security boundaries around everything. Uh, it's very clear to me that there's there's there, there's there's been a lot of thought in, in probably both Kubernetes and Dapper with this, uh, but it's unclear to me. Uh, what it is I am, uh, what the safeguard against the my things like that. Uh, well, and it's going to be layers as well. Uh, I mean, it's going to be like right now we're going to be able to do this, and in three years maybe we're going to do all of that. Hmm. So um, I, I've been part of a few uh, audits, and it's not that easy always to explain to you know, especially when it comes to technology to people like what how secure is this like what what does secure even mean what do you mean by uh you know isolation uh and, and sometimes it could be like yeah we we just want to have a trace of something happen which means that you have to have events for every other event that happened you understand what i mean so you have a meta problem a little bit and that that becomes um, it becomes very tedious when you actually build your own tools for your own infrastructure. Like, and, and so suddenly you have this um, separation from tooling and, and production uh, uh, 
services. Let's let's call them that way. So, what the first thing to do is to know which what needs those audit trails because because you don't really need everything. You need to be able to prove that basically money or everything every data related to money or personal data, uh, you know, for GDPR and everything, yeah. it, it is actually following the law. So that, yeah. that's not at all a technical problem. That's a very much um, a design decision and a business decision uh, from the business side. Um, yeah. now, now, more concretely, yes, you know what? Dapper sounds great. Um, I haven't used it. I haven't uh, played with it. But the, um, the part that attracts me is that it provides a nice layer of abstraction over most of what like, uh, the average developer on Kubernetes should have to deal with. That does not say that it solves everything, because you, you still need to, to talk to this uh, HTTP endpoint. Um, so yeah, for, for the context, from what I understand, Dap, 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 dapper run as a sidecar. It, it's, it's very much like a service mesh or like a Envoy in Istio or like yeah. a so LinkerD. About that way back. And, and, and uh, I realized that, that maybe this is uh, it, it, it related to this concept. Um, but I have never worked in such an environment uh, and, and I have no practical experience of it. I so, only, Believe what I hear right now. Yes, uh, from from experience, it looks really nice on paper, and then when you have to debug it, you you want to cry um, because the and, and that's just the the way things are, right? The the more complex things become, you you just add a layer of abstraction on top, and then you realize that there is something in there that's happening, and you don't understand why, or the error message that you get makes absolutely no sense. To, to what you were trying to do, and then suddenly you have to you have to untie everything and open the box and see what's under the hood of of, of that thing, and that can take also a lot of time. So it's very hard for me to tell you, yeah, this is the way you you should go for it, and and no, a, a proof of concept never hurts, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah that's gonna happen. We're the first step for us, if we decide to go in this direction, will be to make something uh, that is relevant to our business uh, in this way. Now, for your particular case, um, from what I remember the last time, you had um, a fully serverless architecture. So it was a little functions that get triggered and do some work and then shut down. So it's this is very cost efficient like by far. Now, what? Let, let's bring the concept of abstraction, but to, to that. What stops you from making like your, your own wrapper that will log everything, that will take care of, uh, you know, probably some audit trails and security related uh, features um, and, and just go from there? Like if the goal is to have an audit trail, I'm yes. pretty sure you, you could do that without a, a new piece of infrastructure and migrating everything to Kubernetes. Yes. Um, there, is, uh, there isn't much in the way there. There's, there's no... Uh, we, what we do um, rely on is the, the application insights infrastructure in Azure. Uh, and we have, no, we have no quarrel with that. Um, we have... Um, legacy components, um, monolithic like stuff. Um, sure, we have the, the Azure functions and the serverless stuff. Uh, it, that's all great. Um, and but then we have some, some some bigger code running on top of the uh, app service, um, and uh, that's a different game um, because mm. there's no support here for uh, the Azure function stuff. Um, we could have. Of course, we factor these components into Azure Functions, uh, and but um, the, the what what we ended up uh, this I think what, what eventually drove us to um, consider 
specifically Dapper, um, is the actor framework model. Uh, and that's that we, there is something called durable functions in Azure, uh, which kind of is this, but uh, it has different latency um, behaviors, as I understand. And so Dapper has a actor model with a inefficient placement strategy. And as we explore different ways to do this, um, I believe that you won't get the low latency benefits of actors coordinating efficiently outside, uh, if you don't also buy a cluster. Because uh, you need to place the actors uh, on hosts. And, and we looked into, for example, using uh, something called .net or, .NET for Leans, which is also some actor framework they, that Microsoft has built. Um, but it's the same story there. Uh, you need to host the, the, the grains in silos, which are like the equivalent of pods or something. And again, it doesn't seem to fit into Azure Functions or into the serverless architecture. They expect you to provide a cluster service fab. Uh, yeah, Azure has something called service fabric. Um, or uh, you host it on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have some problems that we believe would benefit from having the option to, to use something like a low legacy actor model. Um, and, and we, of course, have to evaluate whether Dapper is that solution. Um, but those are some of the things that make us consider additional things that when you look at the bigger picture, it, it might be interesting to, to consolidate uh, for consistency's sake. Oh, yeah. Uh, right? And, and it's like the, I, the, the vision I have, uh, the idea that I want to kind of anchor uh, is that if we did everything like this, then we would not have the following problems, and it would be a list of things that we wouldn't have to care about. And your primary focus as a developer would be uh, that you write mostly serverless function-like code. And we then have this huge central repository, which tells how everything fits together. Um, there is a uh, handoff procedure associated with putting those things into production um, that requires some sort of double command from two independent people so that uh, deployments uh, are, are audited yeah, in a sensible manner. Uh, and, and, and when I think about um, the problems we will have in, in, in a couple of years, um, I believe it's, it's much easier to make the case for something a little bit more complex mm -hmm. because it makes everything else a little less complex. That makes uh, sense. That, that makes sense. I, I, I cannot, uh, you know, there, there is no absolute here because it all depends on the, the scale you operate on and how much latency we're talking about. And you, you understand that the, the ones who dig into the details, uh, things can change dramatically. Like for instance, I, I, if you have really high load with Dapper, you're still making from your app an HTTP call to Dapper that converts it to something else. So that lat latency is actually, I mean, if you were in like the, the above 10,000 10, requests per second, you, you start to see that. Yeah. But below that, you, you're totally fine. So, and it, re, it relieves a lot of uh, pressure from, you know, some, some cognitive load that, yeah, I don't, have, I don't need to care too much about those things. I can just use that API and be done with it. And that's a very, very fast development cycle. But now, as you said, like, um, when it comes to deployment, the, the enterprise for Kubernetes is CI CD. So if yeah. you don't have CI CD, it's going to be quite, uh, you either have, need to have like very skilled developer, which it's, I mean, it's possible. People can be trained. It's nothing, nothing impossible, but it's something that's going to take time. Can uh, we talk about that? What do you, so what would CI CD mean here? Because for me, it's so, the basic deployment, of course. Um, and, and I have the feeling that we do a lot of this already, but from you, what, what, do, you, what do you put under that umbrella? It, it means that, uh, let's start from, from the code, like uh, someone needs to make a change to the code. Yeah. It creates a branch that has to be peer reviewed by someone else and approved. All the tests run on that branch 
uh, whether it's like a unit test, of course, it could be integration test, even higher level test, like a, spinning up a complete cluster and testing everything um, for real. It, it depends because there is no rules. It, it's really how much resource and time and how long it takes to run those tests because the, the developer experience is very important. But once that is merged to master, it goes, it, it runs the, the test that it should for integration. And then the, continue, the CD part, the continuous deployment, automatically deploy if everything goes green. Because you, it's, this is what happened with Kubernetes. When you update a container image for, of a deployment, it does rolling update. So it is spin up and let's once the application start uh, show that it's ready, meaning that you have an endpoint that Kubernetes poke to see if it answers correctly. Uh, it, it's called the readiness probe. It, it's you can tune it however you want. Once that is done, Kubernetes know that it can allow traffic to be routed to that new new pod. It's called it's a it's usually a container, but um, once the traffic shift there, it, it's depending on the number of time that you have your application, your, your pod, it's going to start rolling one by one. So updating. So for, for a short period of time, you're going to have a different version of your code running side by side. It doesn't last long. But still, you have to keep that in mind because they, there is no downtime. You know, it's, everything is continuous at that point, meaning that it's like you, you take off the plane and you have to fix the engine when you're in flight. Yep. So every change to the database model, every change to the schema uh, of the database, everything has to be in transition always, all the time. Uh, this is actually a lot the, the way we work primarily. Uh, we don't use a standard model for that, uh, but we do it. Um, we, we do think about uh, how our code will be deployed when we write it. We avoid making breaking changes that are difficult to deploy. Uh, we use feature toggles. We use branches. We have tests. Uh, we have number of pipelines. We have deployment stages. We have multiple gates. Uh, most of this is automated. Uh, but we do not deploy into production automatically. Uh, that happens. Someone must push a button for that. Yeah, that's called uh, continuous delivery, not continuous yeah. deployment. But it's uh, it, you get the idea. Like yeah. uh, yeah, I, so, I, I, this is we are very familiar with this, and very we, it, this is what we want to do. We, will, we don't want to wait. Uh, we want to have things uh, in production as soon as possible. Uh, I really like the rolling update part. We don't do that. Uh, we let Azure do something they call a deployment swap. Uh, it is not as elegant, and it's Azure-specific stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it is weird <laughs> and sometimes very slow. Um, but uh, I have seen this in, in uh, AWS in their uh, Elastic Container Service. Uh, the same thing happens there, uh, and I like it. Uh, and I, uh, they said, to me, that's a sensible way to deploy stuff. Definitely. And you, you also have, I, I'm really not familiar with Azure, like I'm full on Google Cloud, so I, I could not. Just ask and I will explain. I can, I can translate. <laughs> ah, good, good, good. That, that's good to know. Uh, because I, like, I, I'm not familiar, but for instance, you can also have a serverless framework on top of Kubernetes, such exactly. as, such as Knative. But that's the one I know, but uh, I'm sure there are others. Um, and they offer basically the same, well, more or less the same as a uh, cloud function, uh, the, the serverless function that you use. Um, we, have, uh, we have a couple of, uh, I wouldn't say that we have serverless frameworks of our own, but we do have those ideas that, what if I could just write script and, and, and get that running somewhere. And, and, and we have some aspects of that. Um, for example, our web page is, is actually that. Uh, it's kind of funny, but our, our, our production web server uh, is actually not running uh, any, any code. <laughs> it, it is just, um, it, it's configured by, a, by one line config which says which 
git commit is supposed to be loaded into production. Nice. And what it does, it, it just basically from that config, it pulls in a, a, a zip file of, of stuff and unpacks into memory in one step. Um, so we can switch, we can run actually multiple versions of our site mm -hmm. without moving the server. So that's a one way we can um, run uh, code on top of the same server infrastructure without having to pay for additional servers or additional like nodes, uh, as long as you know the loads is is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some some of that, um, and and I mean, I I don't I don't know about this, but my hope is that that, that there's going to be space for something like that in inside of what we're going to build. That we're going to we're gonna we're gonna maintain some of those features because what's gonna change for me um, is that all of this CI and CD stuff is gonna be more standardized from mm. our perspective. That's like, no, it's always gonna be like this. It's gonna be a Kubernetes deployment eventually, and it's gonna be consistent, and it's gonna happen like the like, let's say the, the Dapper architecture with the sidecar thingy. Um, and, and 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 like what I like about those things is that identity and and. Um, uh, auditing happens there, right? Yeah, which yeah. service gets to talk to what service and how is kind of configuration, which anyone can audit because it's just these YAML files, as I understand. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm not particularly fond of YAML, but if that's the way they want to do it, I, I don't mind having everything as text. I think it's, I think that's one of the upsides as well for us. Like, okay, we're going to have, like, this is my vision, we're going to have this huge Git repository with lots of YAML files and it's going to describe everything. And it's going to be awesome. Yeah, I, I I understand completely the the vision. Um, it it really depends on regarding centralizing all the the configuration file. It's it's again something that is, looks nice on paper, but always there is always some kind of you know configuration that end up in the application. So it, it's I, I love the approach of a monorepo. Like it, it makes it very clean, you know, like you have everything in one place. The, the day there is a, like a, a complete area that gets wiped out of the surface of the earth, you can redeploy your workload uh, somewhere else. So that, that's, that's quite nice. The, the approach of, that's really hard to say because there is no silver bullet. You have to know what, which level of abstraction you're working on. Like if I have one thing to advise is this, which level of abstraction you want to focus your time? Is it the feature of the business? Is it like the security of the infrastructure? Is it like managing everything yourself so that you have control over everything that's happened? And it's always a trade-off, right? You, you, it's really rare that you get all for nothing. Uh, so I, I cannot advise against or for, but I can tell you this. There is always a way to comply to uh, an audit if you know exactly what they're going to ask. You understand? Especially yeah. if, you, if you know, like, okay, we have 80% of our services that requires a formal audit trail. Well, you understand? You, you are 80%, 100% is not that far. Just standardize and make it for everyone. So it's uh, it's going to be that's the DevOps way. DevOps way, uh, right? To to practice what you're not good at. So if you're not good at uh, audit, like fix it more and more and work on that. But that means also that the more you work on that, the more you cannot work on everything else, right? So. Monitoring, uh, you know, reliability, all, all those things takes time, and there is only 24 hours in a day. So, in yeah. a team, in a team of two, I don't know how much you can accomplish uh, by being. You understand? The, the more you spread your your tech stack, the, the more you you need to have people that specialize vertically into what's what's happening. So meaning that if you deal in, with all the code base of every one of, of the company and they have different languages, different package manager, uh, this, can be, this can be hard. If you have one language in the company that is allowed and one uh, package manager with one way to deploy, you, you're far better than everyone else because you, you can optimize for that. 
the problem comes when you have like three, four, five language and different things and different libraries and different way to do the same thing. Then yeah. Dapper is really good because it abstracts that away. Yeah. So it's really you have to look at the numbers and make some some estimation like okay how 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 long really does it take to convert a service to what we think is good and try with one just see and usually after one hour work you just find out like okay this is this is kind of like doable in a day or you understand like it's not like going to be precise but you will get a better idea of how close you are or how far you are from from the goal I have concerns that, of course, <coughs> the way I develop some applications uh, is, is very centered around me. Uh, mm. And it uh, works incredibly well for me, and I'm super happy about that. And then I bring in something like uh, Kubernetes and Dapper, and suddenly that goes away, and I'm frustrated. And, and those are questions that I haven't answered, and, uh, and I, they, I need answers to those questions. But you know, I, I will tell you what I say with um, when a small team of people uh, try to to join Kubernetes, uh, try to run Kubernetes on their own. And it's like you don't understand the amount of uh, care and maintenance, even those managed services requires. Because you still I ask about that because we, we would we would we would buy Azure's Kubernetes service if we were we're going to do it. Um, and, and unless that option looks very much like something which is serverless, we wouldn't touch it uh, because it wouldn't be possible given the time we have. Yeah. Anyway, I showed you the, the database stuff I did with, with JavaScript as well, right? Yes. I am trying to get away from that. Uh, like I, I've done my fair share of homes, uh, like in-house development stuff, which is, of course, it, they solve very specific problems in very specific ways, and, and they're cool and fun and all that. But it, it's consuming so much of my time that, that, that what I really want to do is, of course, like make sure that we cover our basics, that we have something we can grow with, and that we can kind of continuously start. Like, how do we transition? Right? Mm. But first, let, we, let me ask you this. Do, do you have performance problem with your current architecture? Not really. Um, there, there's like RPM. Of course, wants everything to be like as fast as possible because that's nice, uh, especially when we talk to end users. Uh, and and there are there are things in our infrastructure which scale which scale in, in terms of how how much latency they accumulate differently. And, and we have solutions in place to offset the latency so it's not visible, but it's of course there, right? Uh, but I, I we have a very small data set. We we don't have a data scalability problem or a transaction volume problem, which means that we avoid uh, CQRS or things that lead to eventual consistency. Because those things add complexity that I don't aren't needed unless our performance constraints change or like our, our data traffic volume change, right? Definitely, definitely. But you, uh, you have to keep in mind, like, uh, and again, it depends how much, what, what scale you operate on. But in the end, if you want like a, uh, high volume, low latency, it becomes ju just as complex. But if if you don't have, you know, a lot of load, like keeping things simple, is is what allows for for better scalability because it's it's so narrow and simple. It's like the Unix philosophy, like one one tool does one thing, and so it's it's easier. It's not easy, but it's easier to change one thing than to go everywhere and changing the whole architecture and rebuilding everything from scratch all the time. It's it's really time consuming. And halfway through, you don't even remember what you started, no. why you started that. So that, that's a very big problem for us. Like, like I have half the domain, Oscar has the other half of the domain. And we can't even keep that in memory. Yeah. So what we do when we get questions and need to debug stuff is that we read the code. We, we spend time loading the stuff we forgot, uh, and, and, and then we can work on those problems. So, so compartmentalizing is, of course, something that we will need to do, um, which actually leads me to my service, microservice thing. And, and when I first heard about microservices, it's like, okay, yeah, this is the next great thing. Let's do that. Uh, but I never did it. 
Many years went by and I never did it. And then I realized it's, it's mostly about managing more people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah and, no, it's, it's, microservices is about managing more people, not necessarily uh, dealing with technical problems. No, for sure. For sure. Microservices is the way to scale your organizational charts. Yeah. So the more people you, you're going to, if you have like 150 people hammering code every day, microservices make sense because, you know, you, you cannot have a monolith with that many people and still keep velocity for, for making changes to production. This, this is where things go wrong because you have to retest everything all the time, always. And microservices provide this uh, separation of concern where you have a defined API that you know two service two services can agree on, and and move forward. So if you change something, it, it's well changing is never a good idea. It's it's a better to create new one. Yeah. Im immutability is so valuable, like for for everything because it it allows your brain to to discard whatever was before, right? It's just like oh, there is this new thing. I, I the old thing is still there, but I can I can move to the new thing, and so th that way is. I mean, what did we did we do it better? Did we did we forget something? And yeah, so we, that's because that leads me then to the other reason why I might consider that, and that is exactly these meta. So, for instance, how do we do authorization, like authentication? Right? It, it, it's central to, to our system, and it's it's basically the same all over. Or could we get rid of that? Hmm. Could we move that into its own thing that we never touch because it's not needed? And by the way, could we make it impossible to basically deploy that code because it doesn't need to change? So what I would like to be able to do is that I would, I would like to target certain central services. Um, for instance, services that manage personal identifying information, hmm. like GDPR compliance stuff. Could we, could we make that really hard to change? So it's, so it's for the reason that it is secure. And then we need something to do that. We need a platform to do that on. And again, then I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tie a record, but okay, what does the dapper offer? Like, can we, explore, we want to explore the space, uh, see what we can do there, uh, and kind of try to uh, find a consistent, and I really mean that, like, it's going to work roughly the same every time. So, yeah, I, I understand. I, I'm honestly not the best person to talk, to talk to you into dapper. I can just, uh, share the, my experience with those kind of uh, idea yeah. that you 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 try to outsource like most of the job because you don't have time to do everything. So it, yeah. I'm very I'm sure everyone at, the, at some point has had to do to deal with that problem that there is not enough time to do any, to do what yeah. everything that you want. Um, one way I can recommend to see is um, doing chaos engineering task. So see, push it, pushing it to the limit. See how it breaks. Make. I've heard this term, but I'm unfamiliar actually with it. So can you but say something about what is chaos engineering? So, chaos engineering is uh, is a scientific approach to. There is a definition that I never remember, but it's basically to test the limit of the system, so that you can offer guarantees and gain confidence into it. Like for instance. Uh, uh, do you know if your backup works? Well, one way to do it is to restore a backup and, and, and see if the data are really there. Otherwise, you, you're just wasting your time doing backups. And that's not really, you know, if something happened and you restore and the backup doesn't work, like, what do you do? And all those things, think of a chaos engineering experiment as a fire drill. Like you, you just have to practice. You just have to practice going down the stairs, measuring how long it takes for everybody to come out. See, understanding how the system works by breaking it down. And actually, the 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 chaos part is actually really small. It's more like I would say reliability engineer. Like okay. you have to be able to answer the question: How much customer can we handle? Yeah. You know how how fast can we deploy? I ask myself that sometimes, and, and um, I know roughly the answer to some of the things. But yeah, but that's the roughly is, part that beats you. There are more unknowns in there. I know that. Yeah, so you have unknown unknowns. So yeah, there are things that you don't, you don't even know the question yet. You understand? Like, for instance, the one of experiment I did on Kubernetes 
you see you have like a, let's say you have four four or five uh, pods of your application for your application so five instances of your application you scale you add one then you go one down which one gets killed the first one or the last one and those questions are really important when you're dealing with, uh, you know, cash. For instance, oh, is the one that gets killed the one with the least cash or the one that has the most cash? Yeah. And so if you see a spike in your system and you wonder what the hell happened, uh, you know, those kind of things can help you at least, you know where to look. Or you, it gives you, chaos engineering gives you more questions that you know at least what to ask the system. Otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, yeah, you... So, I, I mean, I, I, can, I, I think I understand now. Um, I mean, we, we have, something has, I know there's a change in, in DevOps uh, related to Docker, which started, I, guess, I started seeing errors. I'm like, what? Why? And then it was just, they changed something about the command line interface. But I couldn't relate those errors to those things. And so I finally, I started realizing what it is. And now when I got that error today, I realized, oh yeah, I know what it is. Yeah, exactly. Ex I could relate it to what I've learned about what they changed. Exactly. And so for, you know, for your chaos, okay, there is one prerequisite for chaos engineering, and that's uh, monitoring. You have to yeah. be really good. Yeah. You have to have really good monitoring. And the, the purpose as well to do an experiment is to see what you need to know about the system in order to prepare. And those experiments will give you uh, tons of information or at least knowledge and confidence of what the system can sustain. Yeah. Um, and for Dapper, it's basically what happens when a service doesn't answer. What, what is the error message? You, 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 you'd be surprised how complicated those error messages get. Uh, because, or if you need to connect to a database, what's the timeout of the default libra the library? Every library has a default timeout. Like, what is it? How, how long can we... You know, because you, you will not find out that the thing breaks until it hit the timeout. So if the timeout is like half an hour, it means that you will lose half an hour of data uh, that will get, you know, bundled up somewhere and you don't know where to find them. And those questions makes like you get a really in-depth knowledge of the system and that allows for, OK, what can we do? And so this is site reliability engineer, right? You. You, you have to have like service level indicator, so it's your metrics, and then you have to have service level objective, like what you want those metrics to be. And then above, it's like service level agreement, like who should we pay if that number doesn't get hit or something. So if you have like a, what we call an error budget, so it's like how much downtime can we have per day, month, year, uh, depending on how many nines you have, how many nines of uh, uptime you, you guarantee to have. And once your error budget, there is some leftover, that leftover is used to do chaos engineering experiment. Hmm. So if you break something, you still maintain your, your service level agreement. You understand? And so that, that brings it like a, it, it's such a number game. But once, once you deal with money and you have a budget, because you already have a budget, right? You, you have to stay in line with whatever cloud bill you have. Yeah. And, and so what if that part of that budget gets, uh, a part of it gets invested into finding the limit of the system? Yeah. And the, the, the benefit of that is really the in-depth knowledge. Like you, you know how far you can push things. Uh, how, how long it will take to recover from a complete disaster of a, of a you know, data center failure, or you know, how long it takes to migrate a service that is not or redeploying a service that is not responding, and so you, you there is so much knowledge that needs to be put in that that it's it, there is a reason it's a full time job. You understand? Yeah. It's not like a side project or anything. It's really no, no, it, it, and for us, it's like. That's not going to happen, not today. But but eventually, I hope that we'll get to a point where 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 we have the resources to actually have people uh, work uh, work like this. But you can and start small, like as I yeah, said, like yeah. So I mean, it, it's it's like 
you asked me whether maybe we could do it something simpler, right? And I believe we can, but I don't believe it's going to last. Right? Mm. I don't. I don't believe we're going to be able to grow very well with it. And I. I. I and then that's why. And I worry about like. Okay, so. Like. The, so what we do, like our Azure functions today, they kind of fill this role that we identify a problem, we do it, and then we don't do anything else at all. Then that's done and it's deployed and no one touches it. Uh, and, and, and that's great because, yeah. because the problem is solved and we can move on and we don't go back to it. Uh, but there's like there, there, there are a couple of checkboxes that we need to go through. Like, did we do this? Did we fix that? Did we do that? Did we... Like, and I mean, I, even if we do some things with, with, with Kubernetes, um, the Azure functions can still stay Azure functions as long as they meet the requirements. Um, and again, those requirements, they are business requirements. Um, and uh, we have our CTO, he works diligently, um, do it, uh, yeah, I'm gonna mess that up again. But he, he, he works very hard on trying to figure out like, okay, what should we do? What do we need to do? And, and we have our legal department as well that's kind of trying to figure out, okay, what are our obligations, what do we do, and so And there are those in that in, in, in that area that, that we need to wait for. Like they need to set, they need to understand um, some things before we also move forward with some things. So we don't just run ahead and do things that, that might be unnecessary. So there is one aspect as well that I'd like to to touch on is that what how you, what you're gonna do with all that data? Let's say let's say you have that data, you know you you know everything that happened, you know you're gonna have to plan for the expansion of that data. You're gonna have to have a life cycle for your that data. Like how long can you keep it? Because you you're paying for it, whether whether you use it or not. How do you so query it? Our, our current plan is basically around application insights. Uh, it seems to be well integrated in these cases, and of course it's one of those Azure things, right? You get it. Mm -hmm. uh, you pay you pay for consumption, uh, mm -hmm. so it's nice pricing. Uh, you have some knobs. Uh, you can decide retention up to two years. Uh, so there, there, it is a managed service with some features built in for that. Uh, but there's compliance issues with that as well. We had a question of whether like could we use this to want to audit this thing, and then it became a retention problem, and then it had to be like legally, can we can we is two years enough? Stuff like that. Um, so so the. It's, it's for us, it's going to be like whatever is most convenient given what we know, what we're comfortable with, what we work with. Because we build up experience around those tools. Let and, me... and, and, and I want to keep using those tools, but there are limits to that. And, and so like, you just gonna have to, you have, you're just going to have to play to the strength of those things. Mm. Let me ask you something. Like, uh, do you, Have you heard of tracing? Uh, well, well in the sense that you leave data files with information in them, uh, or do you mean instrumentation more like? like yeah, like a t telemetry, like, like following the life of a request from yeah. from the the in ingress to to where you store it or to the egress back. Yeah. So that's also a nice way to visualize yeah. everything that's that's happening, and I think it's 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 work. To, to set that up because you know everything that touch a code and infra at the same time is just a lot of work it doesn't matter what you do but the insight that you gain from that you will find out in advance where is your bottleneck yeah. um, and I'm not talking uh, so much as uh, like latency or you know the, the some basic metrics I'm talking more like which customer is actually bringing money because once you know who, who is the customer that use the most resources, you can actually hook that and talk to business about it. Like, hey, we spend a lot of money on those things. Should we work on making this more efficient? So that's more like projection. This, this data can help you make decision about what to work on next. What is the most important thing? And to answer that question, what is the most important thing right now is actually very, very valuable. And so instead of looking at how, how can we scale the infrastructure, look at how can we scale the business side. That, yeah. that, because, you know, the first rule of journalism, if a story doesn't make sense, follow the money. You know, it, it's really like that. Uh, look at how, where is the money coming from? 
from the business perspective, like what what makes money in there, and and so decision gets easier because you know if it's something that nobody cares or that you have to be careful because sometimes you don't see the value of something that brings money indirectly. But basically, you want to to know like to tie up the revenue of the company to the infrastructure, so your metrics. And th those scalable questions becomes much easier because then it's easy. You can have discussion with the upper management saying like, okay, uh, we want to move into that direction. Then you know a little bit like what sh change should happen in the infrastructure for that. And, and those discussions are interesting because you have data to back, th back that up. And it's not like I feel that or I think of, and, and, and that is quite, it's a more professional and factual conversation than just people guessing, you know, oh, I think it's going to go that way. And, and that comes with, suddenly you're a data engineer because all you do is shifting data from point A to point B and format them in a way, and you have to make sure that those data are accurate. Um, it, it's... It's a lot of area of engineering that are touching that. But if you follow, like, if you can have a conversation with business about that and they give you feedback, you give them feedback about the infrastructure and everything to, to see. And suddenly you have a common, common language. You have something that you, you both understand because you see the same thing. Uh, that, that, I feel, is also something that maybe is more should be prioritized than you know what tech should we bet on because it's always a bet right yeah so i don't want to get hung up on dapper i mean i guess i'm using it as an example because it, it's something but that's part of the thing for me like if if everything goes through that sidecar then the tracing should always be built in and you shouldn't be able to get away from it because the the deployment is sealed there's there's no other traffic coming out of that thing yeah, but you have to be careful that uh, the the tracing part, you get an ID of the request. Mm -hmm. In the code, you need to pass yeah. that ID to the to, around yeah. to do that. So it's kind of like you need to adapt the code to to focus on. Because that this is where I, if the value proposition is going to make sense, then I want some of that those problems to be solved by that. Mm. And if that's possible, great. If that's not possible, then then we're not fixing the problem. We are just shuffling things around. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, that's one of the big issues with, with instrumentation, right? Because we do use application insights. But the best we get is that, yeah, we, we see the database queries, and we see the requests, and we see, we see, we see some stuff, tracing stuff. But we don't see how they relate. Yeah, exactly. It's like that is not captured in the code because that wasn't written there from the beginning. It wasn't built with that in mind. You and know so what? It's like ninety nine percent of the company I see um, when it comes to monitoring, they monitor CPU and memory, and that's such a low level metric that it doesn't make sense to me. And to work on that part where you actually understand where you're making the money per request is, is it simplifies so much because you know what to optimize. You, you, you know what to care about. Otherwise, you, you're always in that, stuck into that lower level of abstraction, which is infrastructure, and you manage that, and you, you have no impact whatsoever. You only get orders from above about, oh, we need to scale this, but you don't understand what, what needs to scale. And most of them, they just throw money at the problem and say, let's buy more, yeah. more infrastructure. Um, that could be a valid technique. I, I'm not saying like it's wrong. I, I, most of the case, actually, it's really smart because engineering time versus infrastructure, yeah. infrastructure is like 99% time uh, cheaper. I, I, it's for me, it's like, it's a bit sad. <laughs> it's like an uninformed decision. And, and I, I do know that the first time we had some performance issues that we wanted to address, I did uh, do some tracing, and I concluded that if we're going to make this better, uh, none of these solutions will improve the bottom line. Mm. So we should not do them. So we, ex we excluded some things and then decided to basically use a, 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 a premium block storage account as a read store, because it would always be warm, mm. uh, and, and that first load time would go up.
but that's one of, that, that's really nice um i i would still recommend like if if you have one thing to work if there is only one thing you can do is don't change too much of the infrastructure now and start to understand your system better by using tracing doing some chaos engineering experiment of course all of that is like it seems like a nice to have but uh, the return on investment is actually quite high if you can have because suddenly you have a communication channel with the business and that facilitate a lot a lot of the prioritization work which is always difficult like most of the time people don't know what's the next things they have to work on so tra tracing doesn't sh shouldn't require so much change in your code you know it's maybe it, i'm I, in my head it's like you have to pass another parameter around yeah but that's about it hopefully it is uh, of course you always have edge cases like you know, uh, it, it's not always that you receive a request and you reply. Sometimes you pass it down or sometimes it's like a, a data flow. So the data comes and you pass it to somewhere else. So the, the, there is different um, scenario where you can see, OK, where, where is the data flowing? But, but by having a trace of, you know, if you have the, the request ID and the customer ID, that brings a lot of value because you know which which are your good customer. Yeah. And we, we, we do we do some of these things like we tag uh, stuff right uh, with with something which is unique, uh, so that we can kind of aggregate across a lot of dimensions and just oh yeah this is that thing and and so and the yeah. the project for that is called Open Telemetry. Yeah. And uh, yeah. highly highly recommend it. Like yeah. this is. I think there's something going on there with Dapper as well. Oh, for sure, for sure. It it, be, it it's like the the standard now for yeah. most of the of the tracing in the tracing world. But th that's something that you know. I always see like uh, so many companies have a logging problem, meaning that the cost of logging is so huge, they yeah. they don't know what to do, and they're looking yeah. for cheaper alternative. But actually, if you have uh, tracing you understand that you don't need to log that much you only need to log like if an error happen or if a service services is misbehaving and, and that reduce the amount of of work because they use logging for debugging and so and you know instead of that maybe write more unit test or integration test that could actually give you a proper message in your logs that you at least understand what's going on instead of having to trace everything yeah. You, because think about it, you log in a text file on a disk, right? This is really, really inefficient. If you store that in a database, it would be like one fourth of the of the weight, uh, kilobat wise. And so that way, you have a really nice index because it's stored in database. Yeah. Um, you you have like tons of tooling to query and to uh, you know store, restore, migrate. I have to tell you something about the uh, application insights in this case, which we do use uh, for some of these things. I don't know and anything it, about it, so tell me. No, that's what I wanted to tell you. Because <laughs> it's a cool. I, have to, I think Microsoft did something cool here. They have this thing they call Azure Data Core. Okay. Which is like this huge thing. You in, you put data in it, unstructured stuff. Then they have uh, like they sort it up, right? And then you get a a Hadoop like query language they call a KQL. Oh, okay, uh, nice. And you run across all dimensions, whatever you want. And it is fast. Wow. Uh, so and you can you can buy it in two forms. You can either buy it as a cluster, and then you can do whatever you want with it, like right? customer retention and whatever. Or you can buy it as an instrumentation mm. uh, library, and then you get less features and and uh, more like purpose focused. Uh, but it's uh, consumption based pricing. That that might be worth worth exploring uh, more, you know, and having some some of those um, queries. Like telling you who, like, what's the best use of our resources? Yeah, and I, I noticed that they, they, they it seems like I can, we can kind of see the writing on the wall when more and more services pop up, and you kind of see that, oh, yeah, they're using the same tech underneath here. Yeah, I know this, right? So recently they released some way to do that with all your resources. Now you can use that language to query your infrastructure. Mm. Uh, you can see, uh, it's like, 
I like it. It's, it's, that's, that's, one, that, that's one of the things that makes me go like, oh, this is nice. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think to, to have a, a good insight of your, of, of, from a business perspective, to know yeah. what's going on, it's very valuable. And I, I'm sure you're on the right track. Knowing you, you already, like, uh, you already thought about it. Well, yeah, but it, the, the hard part now is like rallying behind it for the right reasons. Mm. This, is the big, this is the big thing for me. Like, do we commit to this? And how far do we go? And does it make sense? Well, look, yeah, I, I would, I would relieve you from that uh, pressure because just, just admit that you're going to be wrong. Just yeah. an, uh, admit, admit now that you're going to be wrong, and yeah, prepare and document your choices. And actually, that's one thing about chaos engineering: it, it will test your assumption. You, you, we always have some belief, like, oh, that service behaved that way. But when you actually test it, you realize I, eh, that's not at all that that. So. Just admit that you're going to make mistakes. Admit that you're going to change it later because you don't know. You don't have a crystal ball. No, neither do I. And, and so just, just know that you're going to be wrong and yep. do the best you can and be prepared to, to back up your choices. Like do, yep. make, make a one-page document about this is what I want to do, this is why, and this is my assumption. Uh, you don't have the time to test everything anyway. But at least with that, you know, you will have a much better base to change things later. Because if you you look at your assumption, if hey, that won't change, we can change that, and, and this is why we can change that. So that that really brings a kind of openness. Like, hey, we 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 should we don't know. We do our best with what we have, and here is why we did it, and that can be easily reviewed by someone else. And, yeah. and improve and people can contribute back and say, hey, have you thought of this? And or here is the nice project that solves that problem. So be open with the de uh, architectural design and decision. Keep a list of your architectural decision. This is super important so that you can change them later without having like a, a you know, attachment of, uh, hey, it's my baby. I built it or, yeah, you know. That. I know exactly what you're. I'm talking from experience. I've been there. I, 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 I was that person, and I, I know how how it affects you. And and I, I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't exactly. Want to be that Exactly. You, you evolved. <laughs> I've been through that enough. It's like, no, it, it, you know what? Co code is going to die faster than you can write it, really. It, it's, it's not... Nobody cares about code. They care about data. You want to... We, we, hey, when you choose a bank, do you choose the bank with the best tech stack? Or do you choose the bank that makes sure that your, the, the money is there? Yeah. You understand? They're probably using COBOL or some awful, awful thing. And they have like review and internal review and just audit all the time. So, you know what? From, from a customer perspective, what, what the experience is going to be is going to define if it's a good product or not. Uh, so, not, don't be attached to code. Code dies. Code, code rots. It's not something like sacred or anything. And it took me like a decade of programming to understand that. So really, no, no attachment to code. It's going to move. It's going to change. It's going to be, be gone before you know it. Unless it's uh, cobalt in a bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're still there. But they're for different reasons. They're just uh, maybe they're too attached. Or maybe it, it takes too long to, you know... They started when there is no documentation, no test, no nothing. So I'm pretty sure they don't even know themselves how it works. I work in those companies. I know that there's stuff and nobody wants to touch because they are not even sure of what's going to happen. And it's not, it's not their fault. But then you have new banks that come on the internet and, you know, they, they have a new tech stack and they do things properly. You have Eyes at all, you have uh, Revolut. You know, those ones are starting to become big players. So... Don't don't sell them short. They're gonna like evolve into something. Uh, you know, they they're gonna add more feature and more feature uh, faster than the, than the big bank can. Yeah, that's gonna happen. What well, we've been doing it. We've done an hour, so um, I want to be mindful of your time. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> we can do that another time if you'd like. Let's reconvene at some future date uh, when we've done some crazy experiments. <laughs>
and 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 uh, we can talk about that. Very good. Sounds fair. Well, take care then. Uh, Thank you. Lovely. All right. Nice talking yeah. to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.